By the way, being afflicted, as the text mentions, during atonement is about as far opposite of celebration as the moon is from the sun. To celebrate anything at that time would be totally disrespectful and certainly premature. In fact, if Satan had his way, it could be a satanic diversion to keep people from recognizing actually what's happening. Friends, affliction has to do with fasting. It has to do with solemnity. And those who follow the feast know that the time for celebration will come at the time of their deliverance, the time of tabernacles. Certainly not at the time of teshuva, not at the time of trumpets, not at the time of Day of Atonement. Now, if you notice, under the Day of Atonement comes the word Yom Kippur, Atonement, and then Yom Hapaduth, Day of Redemption. The finality of this is absolutely marvelous. Redemption is finalized once and for all. And then you see the word Shabbat Shabbaton, a Sabbath of Sabbaths, a very special day indeed. And everyone who observes the Day of Atonement is learning, is recognizing the fact and the seriousness of that day. So, what happens after Shabbat Shabbaton? And what happens then next, before tabernacles? Well, of course, there's a time for Jacob's troubles. I asked someone not too long ago, a good member of the church, what do you think about Jacob's time of trouble? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Oh, what can I say? A time of trouble such as never was before will be going on in the world while God's people are going through Jacob's trouble. The implementation of a worthless death decree by Satan will be given against the saints. But finally, it's time for tabernacles. <laughs> Look at the chart. There's tabernacles, the 15th day of Tishrei. I like to read Psalms 51, 1 and 2, where it's the Lord who shall abide in thy tabernacle, who shall dwell in thy holy hill. He that walketh upright and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. No guile, straight out truth, regardless of peer pressure or anything else. Friends, the saints will stand. There will be kings and priests upon the earth, but Babylon will fall apart. Revelation 18, 20 and 21. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone, cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall the great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. Friends, don't cling to any of the things of Babylon. Babylon will fall, and nothing will remain of it. There are no doubt several tremendous events to take place in connection with the fall of Babylon. Ellen White gives us a pretty good keyhole picture of one of them. I want you to notice it. Read it with me on the screen. By this time, the 144,000 were all sealed and perfectly united. On their foreheads was written, God, New Jerusalem, and a glorious star containing Jesus' new name. At our happy, holy state, the wicked were enraged would rush violently up to lay hands on us and thrust us into prison. When we would stretch forth a hand in the name of the Lord and the wicked would fall helpless to the ground. Then it was that the synagogue of Satan knew that God had loved us who could wash one another's feet and salute the holy brethren with a holy kiss and they worshiped at our feet. Oh, friends, God's final conclusion of things, his people will be on top at last. Yes, they will. They will finally be recognized for the kings and queens they really are. When we heard the voice of God, which shook the heavens and earth, and gave the 144,000 the day and the hour of Jesus' coming, then the saints were free, united, and full of the glory of God, and he had turned their captivity. And I saw a flaming cloud come where Jesus stood, and he laid off his priestly garment and put on his kingly robe, 
took his place on the cloud which carried him to the east, where it first appeared to the saints on earth a small black cloud, which was the sign of the Son of Man. While the cloud, catch this now, while the cloud was passing from the holiest to the east, which took a number of days, the synagogue of Satan worshipped at the saints' feet. From Daystar 314, 1846. Remember this synagogue of Satan mentioned in the book of Revelation? Where he says, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. They say they're the children of Abraham. They say they're spiritual Israelites, but they really aren't. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. They say they are Christ. They say they are Abraham's seed, but they're not. They talk the talk, but they haven't walked in the walk. Christ said the children of Abraham would do the works of Abraham. And the Bible clearly says that Abraham kept the commandments and the statutes and the judgments. Let's look at the chart again. And we'll see there the Feast of Tabernacles. And under it the words Haggah Asif. That means a festival of ingathering at Christ's coming. And when I think of that festival of ingathering, I think of Psalms 50, verse 5 and 6. Where the word says, Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Patriarchs and prophets says something very interesting about this Feast of Tabernacles. She says, The Feast of Tabernacles was not only commemorative, but typical. It not only pointed back to the wilderness sojourn, but as the Feast of Harvest, it celebrated the ingathering of the fruits of earth and pointed forward to the great day of final ingathering. You see, the young people that enjoy the Feast of Tabernacle are ever reminded that God is going to gather His saints and give them a glorious reward. The text goes on, When the Lord of the harvest shall send forth His reapers to gather the tares together in bundles for the fire, and to gather the wheat into His garner, at that time, the wicked will be destroyed. The text says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Friends, these feasts keep that in mind, especially tabernacles will not let you forget these facts. Truly, we will someday tabernacle with the Son of the Most High. Notice Ellen White's view of the coming, the resurrection, and the gathering of the saints into the clouds of glory. I think she puts it so beautiful in the, in the day star. Written way back in 1846. Can you imagine that? Quote, Then the angel ceased to sing, and there was some time of awful silence when Jesus spoke, those who have clean hands and a pure heart shall be able to stand. My grace is sufficient for you. At this our faces lighted up and joy filled every heart. And the angel struck a note higher and sung again while the cloud drew nearer to the earth. Then Jesus' silver trumpet sounded as he descended on the cloud wrapped in flames of fire. He gazed on the graves of the sleeping saints and raised his eyes and hands to heaven and cried out, Awake, awake. Awake, ye that sleep in the dust and arise. Then there was a mighty earthquake. The graves opened. The dead came up clothed with immortality. The 144,000 shouted hallelujah as they recognized their friends who had been torn from them by death. Oh, friends, a time of trouble is coming and some will die in it. But they will join their mentors. The 144,000 will see them coming back to life and they'll shout for joy. And in the same moment we were changed and caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. We all entered the cloud together and were seven days ascending to the sea of glass. Let's take another look at this chart. Uh, 